Hello and welcome to Backyard Farmer. I'm your host, Kim Todd. We're glad you could join us for another hour of answering those gardening questions. We really do love hearing from you and seeing all those great pictures you send in. And if you'd like to submit a question and some pictures for a future show, Get in touch with us by sending an email to byf at unl.edu. Tell us as much as you can about your question, including where you live. And of course, keep up to date with Backyard Farmer on our social media pages, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and Pinterest. We're always starting with samples. And Kyle, you have one that we're sad about because it's new and it's devastating, right? Yes. I brought in something that we've been receiving quite a few questions and, and concerns about uh, for good reason. So these are uh, magnolia scale, and you can see these immature female scales here on this, this twig, all these kind of white spots. And so these, these scales, they overwinter as uh, immature uh, scales. Early spring, they'll begin feeding again, and uh, the females will, will begin growing growing in size. As they, they begin feeding, they, they produce this white waxy secretion that covers their body. And then throughout the summer, that will slowly begin to, uh, to kind of turn to, to, it'll fade away and kind of turn to more of a tannish color. Now these scales, uh, they're one of our largest scales here and they, they get up to about a half of an inch, these females, and uh, will reduce, or excuse me, exude lots of, of sap or um, uh, honeydew. And so you're seeing that here on some of these leaves, kind of this, uh, this shiny, sticky substance that's on, on the leaves here. That's the, the honeydew, which is basically from the sap that they're, they're feeding on. And that's one of the first things that you might notice if you have these on your, your magnolia or tulip trees uh, or, or related species. Um, in addition, you might see a lot of different insects that are attracted to that honeydew. Uh, you'll, you'll have all kinds of wasps, flies coming into that. So these can be uh, quite problematic in, in some cases, especially if you have heavily infested branches, they can cause dieback uh, for smaller, uh, smaller trees. It, it can really be a problem. And so you might wanna look into treating these. There's a few options. You can use uh, horticultural oils or insecticidal soaps. Um, and if so, like with all scales, you wanna really target those in the, in the fall when, when you have the crawlers. Um, and that's gonna be sort of late August through, through September. So you might wanna give um, you know, a couple of treatments in that time frame, or you could go with, uh, with, with a systemic again going in in the fall when you have those uh, crawlers emerging. All right, and it's really sad because they are all over the magnolias on campus yeah. and in Lincoln. So pay attention, audience. All right, Dennis, Hi. bring it up. <laughs> this is a garter snake. But we're getting a lot of calls. People see these. This is a female common garter snake. It's not uh, the most common. The most common is the plains. We have four types of garter snakes in Nebraska. And color means nothing. Any of them can be any color. It's the number of scales that we know which species it is. But I get a lot of calls about these. And the biggest thing is exclusion to keep them out of your house mm -hmm. or around your house. We tested all the repellents on the market. We tested lime, sulfur, ammonia, mothballs. They're worthless. You have to put enough mothballs in your house to kill you before it's going to bother the snake. Um, so exclusion is the best thing. They can't chew through anything. They can't even chew through duct tape with their small, tiny, less than a 16th inch teeth. I can't get the snake to bite me. I never can get snakes to bite me. <laughs> Professional courtesy. Um, <laughs> But you need to plug up all the places where they get in now. Mm -hmm. Don't wait till September when they're starting to get in the crawl space. I had this happen with a couple people. They wait it until they start to see them in the house in November, plug up their holes, and then in May I get frantic calls. They're all coming up in the house. Well, you lock them in the crawl space and they want to go out and they had to come up. Mm -hmm. And then I have to go in the crawl space and exclude them out. Mm -hmm. um, so if you're going to do any kind of exclusion using caulk or anything to keep them out of the crawl space or the basement or anywhere around the house. They go up dryer vents, so you want to put a wide screen around the dryer vent. Do that now in July when they're all out and about. Excellent. Don't wait till September when they start to come in to do your exclusion or you'll lock them in. Excellent. It's really quite pretty. Yeah, she is. She's very pretty. She's gravid too. Oh boy, yeah. new babies. Yep. All right, John, not so pretty. What is that? 
So I brought some holy cabbage. <laughs> uh, and it's about to get holier. And I'm going to tell you how I know that. Uh, so this is a fine specimen from the backyard farmer garden. Because uh, we let things do their thing out there. We let things do their thing out there. So you see all these holes in here. So we have some caterpillar feeding, some other insect feeding that's going on. And then down, I don't know, it's, they're really teeny tiny. Uh, if we zoom in, you see there's like little specks on there, little white specks. And that, I'm trying to figure out where to hold, there we go. So you see that? So we're gonna have some more uh, hatching out of some cabbage worms uh, there. And so they're gonna get holier after those things hatch out because they will eat the whole leaf and leave very little for you. Mm -hmm. And so uh, some things that you can do, uh, cabbage is something you don't have to have pollinators for. So what you can do is actually exclude them before they get to this point. So there's like a little uh, mother butterfly that comes along and lays her eggs or a, a moth. Uh, there's two different types of cabbage worms at least. Uh, and so you put a row cover over them to keep them away and keep the other things away. It's too late for that. So you can wait and hand pick them or you can use a control method, probably the easiest and the best, and it's actually an organic, um, is using BT, uh, which is uh, Bacillus thuringiensis. thuringiensis. Uh, say that 10 times fast. Uh, or you can buy it under the product names like Dipel or um, Thuricide, those types of things. It's just a powder you put on and it takes care of those guys pretty well. Excellent, because you know that protein is really just not what you're after with your slaw. It's not, slaw. no. Yeah. yeah, I had to, you know, not cabbage but kale and it wasn't worms, but I was chopping some up and had to tell uh, uh, Jody this week that I had earwigs crawling out of my kale. It was a little disturbing. So. <laughs> I guess. All right, Kyle, you get the first set of pictures. You have, I think, five here that are relatively quick. Just ID, what is this guy? Uh, the first one here is a Hershey viewer and just really wants to know what this unusual insect is. He has a pair of pruning shears, so we get a little bit of size with that. What is that? Yeah, that's a, a grapevine uh, beetle, which is, it's a scarab, mm -hmm. a root line scarab. And um, they, you know, the adults feed on foliage of, of grapes mm -hmm. and uh, larvae and in rotting wood, so not really a problem. All right, your second one is an Omaha viewer. Uh, they found this while they were picking Japanese beetles off their green beans, and uh, they, they wanna know what this is with those long antenna. Yeah, those long antenna, that's the, the giveaway here. So this is a longhorn beetle. Mm -hmm. um, it's hard to see, hard to tell the, the species for sure because of the, it's a little bit dark, but probably uh, Lepturges confluens it uh, doesn't have a common name, but um, they, they bore in various hardwoods, especially uh, hickory, mm -hmm. if that's what it is. What is it with you bug guys and you don't give common names? I think Wayne had three or four last week with no common name. Yeah, especially things that aren't, aren't big pests, they don't, they don't tend to get they don't a common do it. name. <laughs> All right, your next one, uh, he actually found this at Springbrook State Park near Guthrie Center, Iowa, so the, kind of the middle of Iowa. This one is a horn span worm or a filament bearer, and it's, it's the caterpillar of a moth, uh, a geometrid moth, and uh, they see those kind of uh, appendages on, on the top of the body. That's where the name filament bearer comes from. Those are sort of these uh, filaments that they can extend out when they're threatened, provide some, some defensive function. I'm not exactly sure how, but uh, presumably that's what they do. So they're, they're interesting looking caterpillars, but uh, for, for a geometrid moth. Excellent, and your last one here, this is Omaha. Uh, he said these little, and it's great to have that scale in there, uh, black buds, bugs, they've been doing a lot of damage to the greens, especially uh, tatsoi, apparently. They've tried neem with no results. Yeah, this one's a little bit tougher. That The first picture, it's, it's kind of dark and hard to see. Um, the, the beetle, it looks like to me it has an enlarged hind leg. Mm -hmm. um, and given what it's feeding on, its size, sort of the, the injury to the foliage there, I think it's probably a flea beetle, mm -hmm. which can be um, you know, quite common, pests of, of various leafy greens. Um, for, for these, a few different options for treating, a lot, a lot of times you wanna use um, essentially sort of an integrated um, management. So um, some cultural control along with chemical control you might try if you have a history of issues planting a trap crop like uh, like radish plant that a little bit earlier so they'll be attracted to that and then you can can treat that treat them on that um, but you can use um, spinosad or carbaryl um, there's a variety of products that are are labeled for 
Uh, for flea beetles, you just want to make sure that it's, it's also labeled for whatever you're applying it on. Um, spinosad and carbaryl should be, a, um, should be labeled for, for leafy greens. And, um, and so, yeah, just then pay attention to the, the pre-harvest interval. Excellent. Thanks so much. All right, you have some fun pictures. Okay. So the first one is uh, from a, a viewer who sends us beautiful things. Yeah. He sent us two pictures of this. This is a Lincoln viewer. What is this? Ilicosoceles. <laughs> okay, Cope's gray tree frog. <laughs> that's not gray, that's green. They can be either one. Okay, all right. Color is just like we have blondes, brunettes, and redheads. You never go by color with it, any. With it. Like my scale, I mean my hair is gray, but. <laughs> um, I wish it was scales, but that's... Okay, it's common, very common in the eastern part of the state, and it's actually expanding its range westward and is found as far west as North Platte now. Nice. Well, and it's sitting in his hand, which is yeah, interesting. They're, they're yeah, they're pretty. Yeah. And if then you... worse comes to worse, you can kill them. If you have anything like citronella, bug spray on your hand, it, it's going to die in a couple hours. Ooh, that's so bad to hear. You can, it can't hurt you, but you can hurt it, so don't touch them unless you wash your hands with clean water. Okay, your next one is a Takema viewer, and she's seen these, uh, <clears throat> and she's saying they bless the patio window. Yeah, it's the same thing, just as yeah. the underside. Yeah. And they're just after the bugs. Yeah. So they come out at night, and they're our only true tree frog, and they go after the insects. Yeah, she's wondering about the yellow on the leg. Yeah, some, they all have some yellow, some have more than others. Okay, just sort yeah. of interesting. And your final one, this is a Vermilion, South Dakota viewer. Okay. She wonders if this is a blue racer. Well, there's, there's really no such thing as a blue racer. It's a North American racer, and it could be green, black, or blue. Mm -hmm. The same snake changes colors with stress levels and temperature, like a mood ring, if you're that old. <laughs> um, so it's a North American racer, or yellow belly racer. And it could be, the top can be bluish, bluish gray, green. I've seen them lime green, and I'm seeing them almost black. Same and snake. And they're good guys. Yeah, they, just eat, they, lo they love to eat other snakes and grasshoppers. Huh. Okay, excellent. And what, what mood was that snake in? Can you tell he us? He was a stress mood, yeah. Okay. <laughs> he was darker, so he's stressed. <laughs> oh, brother. <laughs> All right, John, uh, your first one here, uh, this is actually the first question we've gotten about this, but we usually do, and it's, why are the potatoes growing fruiting bodies that look like tomatoes? So he sent us a couple of pictures. What is that? Right, so uh, that happens when conditions are just right, whenever the weather's right and mm -hmm. uh, things happen just right. Tomatoes and potatoes are very closely related. They're, they're first cousins. So they're both uh, in the Solanaceae family and actually they're the same genus, Solanum. Uh, tomatoes are Solanum lycopersicum, which means uh, sun-loving wolf peach, by the way. <laughs> Uh, and uh, <laughs> potatoes are Solanum tuberosum, so basically sun-loving tuber. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the, the flowers that come on the potatoes, if the conditions are just right, they will be pollinated and they will produce fruit. It's not common, but that's how you get new types of potatoes. Mm -hmm. So there's actually uh, one of the All-America Selections winners that we grew out two years ago is the Clancy potato, and you start it from seed, and they come from little fruits just like this. Excellent. Don't eat them. No, do, do not eat. Yeah. <laughs> All right, and your next one, uh, this is an Omaha viewer. He wonders how to slow or stop his zucchini and his spaghetti squash because they're trying to take over everything else. <laughs> well, you don't slow or stop that. The train's already left the station, <clears throat> okay? Uh, so you learn, you know, we, you learn after some experience that tomato or the uh, zucchini and squash, they take up a lot of room. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, uh, as they used to say, a little dab will do ya. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so only one or two plants is all you need, uh, and even that'll take over the, the garden. So I don't plant zucchinis in my own personal garden because they take up so much room and everyone has zucchini. Mm -hmm. Like, you, you know, it just shows up on your doorstep. Right. Uh, so you can try to prune them back and keep them pruned back, uh, but you might want to look at putting them somewhere else next year or reducing the number of plants or um, zucchini or bushing. There, there are no really true vining types, and vining types you can run up a trellis and get them out of the garden. Mm -hmm. uh, so look at like some of the summer squash or other things that you can trellis up, uh, but 
for now it's just cutting back and hacking with a, a machete or something like that. All right. Thanks, John. Well, a few weeks ago, we discussed keeping aggressive plants under control out in our garden. It was a sunny day. They were easy to spot. Tonight, we're going to go under some shade to show you that there are plenty of other sneaky plants that are going to try to take over your yard. With full shade environments are always looking for perennials and ground covers that will let them not have to grow turf because turf does not want to grow well in the shade. One of the problems with some of those plants, however, is that they can really become pretty aggressive. And whether it's by stolons or rhizomes or seed or all of those, you can end up with colonies of plants that are not necessarily in the place that you wanted them. This is an example of a lot of those different plants. And of course, ground covers are supposed to cover the ground, but Lamiastrum, as an example, is one that I didn't plant and it is taking over the vinca. I'm finding it in all sorts of other places in the yard. Another one is Celandine poppy. I didn't plant it. It came from somebody and it has colonized itself by seed mostly in all sorts of other locations. Brunera is another one. This is a seed producer. The big, beautiful leaves are great. It is popping up in lots of different spots. And then, of course, we have northern sea oats. Beautiful in seed head. If you don't pluck off those seed heads, I find it coming up the driveway. I find it in the backyard, in the compost pile. I let the seed heads stand because they're pretty in the winter, and then I deal with what has to happen later. Violets are the bane of people who love perfect turf and have shade, so you have to meet the enemy head on. This is violets. They seed themselves like crazy, and what I've decided to do is let them become a ground cover in the places where I really can't grow turf. But you'll also notice they've seeded into the lawn, of course. When I mow them off, a week later they have more foliage. Another nasty is one called Houtinia. This is still for sale as a ground cover. I didn't plant this one either. I don't know where it came from, but this is one that sneaks its way around by rhizome. I couldn't even get the rhizomes out of the ground on this one. So beware if you see Houtinia for sale and you love the variegated leaves on it. There's one called Chameleon that will really take over the landscape. A couple other plants that are really spreading in the shade are the Lysimachias. This is Lysimachia ciliata purpurea with purple foliage. I've kept it in one clump. You can see it in our Kime courtyard area that has really spread into our sedge area, which of course is another one that wants to take over the earth. And this is related to Japanese knotweed. The original plant was on the other side of the tree and it has begun to creep and leap and seed itself all over, not only into the mulch, but into the yard. So one of the things that you really have to keep in mind if you want plants that are pleasing to the eye, pleasing to the space in a shade environment, is choose wisely for ones that create clumps, that don't seed like those violets do. If you want things to spread in the shade, choose the plants that will. You know, in this battle, it's going to take a sharp eye and a lot of persistence to corral those plants that want to take over, and that's my backyard, so you can tell what kind of a good job I do on that. Or not. <laughs> All right, um, Kyle, two problems with onions in the Columbus Garden. They were both started from bulbs. One has this guy in the foliage, and the other one has a rotten bulb. What do we have going on here? Yeah, so the first one, um, it, it's a little bit... It's tough to say, it's not quite in focus, the, the top of it, and there's actually quite a few kind of pale green caterpillars with white stripes. Um, the only one that I'm aware of that, that will feed on onions at least is beet armyworm, so I'm gonna guess that that's maybe what we have here. Mm -hmm. uh, they, don't, they don't overwinter here, uh, further up north, they only overwinter in southern US, and then they migrate up. Um, beet armyworm, unfortunately, are really hard to control because they're resistant to almost everything, um, all formulations, of, or most formulations at least, of BT for caterpillars, um, many insecticides. Uh, neem is uh, an option for, for uh, uh, beet armyworms. It does have some efficacy, so that might be something to, to try to look into uh, if you're, you're having a widespread issue in your, your garden. 
The second image with the uh, with the rotting bulb, I'm, I'm really not sure. I, I did ask Kyle uh, Broderick mm -hmm. in Plant Path about this as well. He did think it looked like it had some some soft rot, right. but he he also indicated that it, it you know that that requires some sort of an entry point. So it could be some insect feeding that that has created that entry for that that pathogen to get in there and and start rotting that uh, that onion. Okay, excellent. And your second one here, uh, this is Omaha. They had great tart cherries, and every single one has one of those nice little cherry maggots in it. What do they do about it next year? Yeah, um, once once the maggots are in there, there's there's nothing you can really do. So for for these, control is is all about prevention, and you have to you have to spray, you have to treat um, those those adults. So this is is um, from uh, a cherry fruit fly, which is a true fruit fly to fritted, and uh, they they lay an egg inside those developing uh, cherries, and then the larvae feeds inside of there. So. They have a really broad emergence. Um, it's really variable depending on weather. So you have to kind of monitor for, for when they're emerging. It can be May all the way through July. Cool. So the best thing to do is put up some sticky traps uh, for those in, in your cherry trees. And, uh, and then once you see those emerging um, is when you would start spraying and then spray until, you know, until you're not seeing treat, until you're not seeing any more adults emerging. And uh, really a good option for those, again, is, is spinosad. That's a pretty effective treatment for, uh, for those uh, cherry fruit flies. Excellent, thank you, Kyle. All right, it's scat night. So, <laughs> oh, last time was. I know, so this first one, uh, let's see found this in the backyard. Uh, it's not cat, because theirs doesn't go outside, wants to know who this is leaving the calling card. Yeah, it's, it's kind of hard when I can't tease it apart and look inside of it. Um, that could be skunk or opossum. Mm -hmm. It's black and smooth enough that I think it might be. One or the other, all right. Yeah. Your, your next one is, uh, this is a deck, a Hebron resident, finds them almost every morning. He said there's lots of bug bodies in it, yeah. and he wonders if it's frog poop. No, it's bat. Really? Yeah. Okay. Frog poop is always in the water, and it's covered with mucus. This is bat. Okay. All right. And your third one is uh, animal scat in various areas, driveway, et cetera, black and full of seeds. It, there is a neighborhood fox. Uh, and yeah, but, it's not fox. It, it, what it is, it's a young raccoon, I think. Mm -hmm. Most raccoons will, they have latrine, mm -hmm. but young ones, they don't use a latrine or they haven't been taught to use a latrine yet. Um, not potty trained. Yeah, not, not <laughs> latrine trained raccoon. Um, but I say it's a young raccoon. Okay, and There's, any way to discourage them? You can live trap and remove. Okay. Put a diaper on them. <laughs> In other so words, do, no. <laughs> so do the raccoons that misbehave, do they get latrine duty? Do they have to clean I, up? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Yeah. <laughs> okay, on that note, <laughs> John, you have a couple of tree questions. The first one is an Omaha viewer. Uh, two autumn brilliant service berries four years ago. They have not grown at all. They put on minimal leaves. They w he wonders what's going on here. So I think there's a few issues going on. So if you if you can if you zoom in and look closely, you'll notice that you don't have the root flare that you should have at the base of a tree. Mm -hmm. So these the the major problem is that they're planted too deeply, and that's like the one thing that will cause a tree to fail to thrive more than anything. I just mm -hmm. did a house call a few weeks ago and looked at a, an apple tree that we call it like a telephone pole tree. Right. Like there's no root flare at the bottom. Uh, and then we have um, multiple stems. So those, you know, that can cause weakness in the plant. Uh, so I think those are the two, two major issues. Unfortunately, um, there's, there's not really anything you can do because the, the planting was just so bad. I mean, I don't know that you would even like dig them up and replant them. I think it's gone beyond that. I think so too. All right, and your next one is, uh, this is a great picture. She, she's clear, she wants to know to mulch or not to mulch, and there. This is actually two trees on the same street. Obviously, one and the other. What What are you going to tell people on this one? Right. So, uh, you'll see two different mulching uh, methods here. 
Uh, so mulching really helps with, with water retention in the soil. Uh, and so it's, it's good to do for newer trees, like the first few years. It's not necessary after that, really, uh, unless you, you do want to conserve water. Or if you don't want to mow around it, like you can you know, do that to, to reduce mowing if you have low branches. However, there's a right and a wrong way to do that. And we have like the perfect example in this picture. So the first tree, we have a little bit of mulch there. You don't see, you know, you don't see it mounded up. The one in the back there, we call that a tree volcano. Uh, and tree volcano is bad. Uh, so tree volcano, we've got the mulch sort of heaped up and it will be heaped up on the trunk, which causes, you know, the, the, the tree can't breathe. So where that, you know, the, the earlier trees were planted too deeply, that causes a lack of oxygen there to the, the crown. And that's what happens here. We can also get rots. So you want to not do a tree volcano, but you can mulch. Excellent. So uh, the little voice in my ear is saying, does the tree volcano require a sacrifice? It would be the tree being sacrificed. Yes, it'll be the tree sacrifice. You don't have to sacrifice any virgins <laughs> for that one. Excellent. <laughs> well, our garden is putting on a great show. We've done a good job of keeping the weeds down and our ornamentals are really starting to show off. Let's take a few minutes to hear from Terry James out in the backyard farmer garden. This week in the backyard farmer garden, everything's looking beautiful. Getting all of our weeds under control and the garden is really coming into its own. We're gonna start looking at our new All America selection winners. And the first one is one that I'm really excited about and is looking fantastic in the garden. It's a new coleus. It's a vegetatively propagated one and it's called Main Street Beal. This one is this gorgeous burgundy with some kind of gold and green tones in it. Uh, really fantastic looking, full sun, part sun shade. So you can pretty much put it anywhere you want. Doesn't need a lot of water, not a big water hog. So normal water needs, stays upright, bushy, uh, 24 to 36 inches tall. And it does get a few of those kind of funky coleus blooms, but not too much. We're just pinching them off. So stop by the backyard farmer garden and check out our new coleus main street bale. You ready, John? Always. Always. All right. This is a St. Paul viewer who wonders about trimming off the lower Brussels sprouts leaves. The Brussels are starting to form in the leaf axles. Do you do that? You can do that. I mean, uh, you can, it'll help with, with diseases and splashing, so. All right, uh, the second question from that viewer is should you snap the top off no. of the plant? All right, uh, we have a viewer who is watering their tomatoes and their cucumbers using rain barrel water. Is that a yes or a no? Uh, it's okay, you just wanna watch for food safety, make sure there's nothing running off in there. So don't spread on the foliage or on the fruit, just keep it on the ground. All right, is it too late to plant asparagus? Uh, the only problem with it's so hot and dry that it'll not thrive. So you want to wait until fall or spring, but if you have it sitting around, go ahead and plant it. All right. Um, the yellow squash is flowering and setting fruit and then the fruit is dropping. This is a Bellevue viewer. Uh, I've seen this, uh, some, I think, uh, some of it is just heat and, and, uh, moisture issues. Uh, so watch out for that. All right, uh, an Ainsworth viewer wants to know, do they plant the seeds they saved from sweet peas in the fall or in the spring? Uh, I would do them in the spring. All right, excellent. Ready? I'm ready. Okay. Your first one came from multiple viewers this week, Dennis. Okay. Um, squirrels are apparently devastating the honey locust to the point where this viewer is thinking she's gonna lose her tree. What are they doing and why? Okay, there's two things they're doing to trees. One, young males are clipping off the ends and dropping them and then figuring out, what do I do with it? They're supposed to be making a nest. If it's dry and they need moisture, they'll strip and lick. All right, and her second question is, are there trees that you know of that squirrels do not like? They like almost everything. If it's tough, like a walnut, they'll, they'll go for the walnuts, but they won't strip it. All right. This is a Kearney County viewer uh, saying that the vole or mole population has exploded. Should they put down a grub treatment? No. All right. So their second question is what to do. Um, you can trap, and there is one method. You can go to our NEB guide and get those methods. 
All right, and in Springfield, there is a ground squirrel explosion. Is this due to mulch? No, all animals have an up and down uh, cycle, and they're just looking at a cycle in a particular population. All right, and we are out of time, but I'll save that one for you because it's a really fun question. Nice job. Okay, you ready, Kyle? I'm ready. This is a Siloam, Arkansas viewer who is wondering about keeping brown recluse spiders out of the house. They've caught seven of them in the house. And I know we have them on campus. How do you keep them out of the house? Um, that's a complex answer. Exclusion, you know, keeping, sealing things up, keeping uh, doors, any sort of cracks and crevices, and importantly, excluding, you know, whatever they're feeding on is probably the best, best thing, but they're probably already in there. <laughs> okay, we have a viewer who has a carpenter ant problem. She's seen it in her shed and there's a hole next to a window. Should she try to treat herself or get a professional? For carpenter ants, I would definitely go with, go with professional, have them come out and, and check it out and see. All right. See where they are. This is a Norfolk viewer who found a two inch long mud nest with an opening on each end. What is that? Um, it sounds like it could be a mud dauber or, um, or uh, potter wasp. Okay. Has there been an increase in wheel bugs in this state? I don't know if there's been an increase, but I am certainly seeing a lot of them, a lot of questions this, this summer. Especially if people were looking at that beauty shot that was a wheel bug eating a Japanese yep. beetle. Yes. <laughs> All right, John, what do we have <laughs> for Plants of the Week? We have a bouquet here, mm. Plants of the Week. So we, we're going to start with David Flox. So this is the white one here. Uh, mildew resistant, full sun uh, to part shade. You know, a, a nice, beautiful white flower. Then we have this red valerian, uh, which is a uh, long blooming, uh, long season. It does set seed. Uh, it will do well in a rock garden, well-drained soil, so it can take it a little dry. And then we have uh, some edibles stuck in here, uh, just for me. Uh, so this <laughs> is uh, Swiss chard, one of my favorites. Uh, I actually put this in my landscape. You can see the nice color on there. And then this is Mizuna mustard. Uh, so both of these are edible, uh, tasty, and they're actually very attractive. So you can stick them in an edible landscape rather than just relegating them to the, uh, the vegetable garden. And those all came out of? The, the back backyard farmer. Backyard farmer. This one also did. So if you like your uh, Swiss chart a little bigger, you can, <laughs> exactly. you know, let it go to that size. I was looking for one leaf that would actually stay in that little short <laughs> fat vase. Right. Then if you need a snack, you just, you know. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then John goes belly up because we spray. No, we don't. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, your next set of picture questions, Kyle. This is, a, um, this is a Greeley, Nebraska viewer. Is this good or bad? She found it on her coneflowers. Follow-up question, she said yes. It's now on others. What is this? Um, th well, these are, are caterpillars for uh, checker spot butterflies. Mm -hmm. So um, good or bad, I, I guess, maybe a, a bit of both here. Uh, the, the butterflies are, you know, are pollinators and can be beneficial, but obviously causing some damage here. Um, it, depending on the size, these look like they're pretty good size. Um, usually about an inch, they're, they're mature, and so there's really not anything that, you know, at that point you would really need to do because they're pretty much done feeding. Um, smaller, you could maybe treat with, with something like spinosad if, if you really want to preserve the, you know, cosmetic value of those flowers. Excellent. All right, and then we have a Eustace, Nebraska viewer who wonders what is this on the Rudbeckia and what should she do? I, I would guess it's the same thing mm -hmm. that had been feeding here. Um, you know, I think maybe I can see a caterpillar in there, a checker spot caterpillar, I'm not certain. Um, they, they tend to develop pretty quickly, so they might have just already completed, you know, their, the caterpillars are done feeding and, and have left, but I would guess it was also checker spots. Right. And they're both in the aster family, so yep. that makes perfect sense. All right, thank you so much. All right, Dennis, uh, this one, a viewer sent us this picture and several others. Uh, he is saying uh, this is a way to let squirrels sharpen their teeth without chewing up the tree branches. So he, he has put old dog bones on, on sticks against the tree. What do you think of this method? Well, it depends on nutrients. They they're not sharpening their teeth. What they're doing yeah. is they're using the nutrients in the bone. And some of those nutrients may be nutrients that they normally get 
from the cadmium of the tree, mm -hmm. salts. Mm -hmm. And so it is a way to pre prevent some tree chewing. Mm -hmm. If they're after moisture, of course, it's not going to work because the bone is dry. So, yeah, and if the squirrel put it up on that metal thing, that's a good squirrel. <laughs> um, but yeah, but they'll do that to get the nutrients, not to sharpen. They don't need to sharpen their teeth. Their teeth sharpen against each other, not the bone. All right, excellent. Uh, the next one here, this is, um, this is in Lincoln, yeah. dropping numerous small branches, uh, especially bad this year. What is causing this and what do we do about Yeah, this? I noticed this, I have the same thing on my oak and every day when I get home around, you know, at the end of the day, I, I pick up a half a bushel of, of these and it's young male squirrels. We had, you know, squirrels had a good reproduction because we had a lot of nuts last fall. Mm -hmm. The trees have a lot of good growth because of the moisture. Mm -hmm. And so they're trimming the tree for you. And what it is, the males are clipping off the end to make a nest, but then they're too, they don't know yet. Why did I do that? And they just let it drop. Um, they're young males, what do you expect? <laughs> um, so yeah, and again, trees and squirrels evolve together. It's gonna be fine. Right, yeah. Just. It's just the way it just is. Just enjoy it. Yeah. And this is, uh, this is Southwest Lincoln, and something is eating plants, even the cactus. Wow. So. Uh, this, so yeah. what is this? As big as those bites are, I'm almost thinking deer. If they're in an area where deer can get to it. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, deer lips aren't that sensitive. And so, you know. Yeah, after the moisture in the cactus. Maybe yeah, they, they need moisture. And so that's why yeah. they're going for the yeah. I, I, the, the big as those bites are, it looks like a browser like deer. Okay, all right. How do they keep them out? Cage the plants. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty much. Okay. <laughs> I'm not sure of the situation. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. There are little things that you can put in there and you put peanut butter on them and the deer goes to put their nose to the peanut butter and there's like two D cell batteries in there and it just shocks the deer and they go, ah, because their nose is so sensitive and they won't go back to that area. And they sell them there, they stand about this high and there's two D cells in there and you put peanut butter around these wires. Okay. If a deer is eating cactus, I don't think that's going to deter. <laughs> I don't <it>. Actually, <laughs> electricity is pretty darn. <laughs> It'll do the well, job. I'm, I'm just glad to hear that the squirrels aren't sharpening their teeth on animal bones to become like assault squirrels. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, John, this, uh, this first couple pictures uh, is from a viewer who has tomatoes in containers, and why are they turning black on the bottom? And we had two or three other viewers that are starting to send this in. So I think your second picture shows what's going on yeah, here. Yeah, so that's blossom end rot. Mm -hmm. A lot of people think it's a blight, it's a disease. It's actually uh, a physiological disorder. What happens is that there's a lack of calcium in the fruit, not necessarily in the soil, mm -hmm. in the fruit. Uh, fruit gets its structure from something called calcium pectinate. So if you make jelly, you use pectin. Calcium is part of that gives it fruit the structure. Without the calcium, it sort of breaks down, it gets soft and mushy and, and rots like that. Usually it's a water imbalance. Usually it's either not enough water, which is definitely possible, or it's too much water and you damage the root hairs, which take up the calcium and more water. So you wanna make sure your water is even uh, to take care of that issue. It should correct itself. Uh, if it's in containers, you might have a calcium imbalance if you've reused that soil over and over again. Mm -hmm. So you might want to use new potting soil. You can get a, a blossom end rot spray that's like a fast absorbing calcium, but that's like the last resort. Mm -hmm. And you can still eat the fruit. You just cut the black yeah. spot out. Yeah. yeah, you just have to, if it's like really rotted, you might have like some pathogens get in. So you right. want to be careful, careful with that. Yeah. Right. All right, thank you. Uh, your next one here is um, planted these tomatoes. This is Sydney, Nebraska. In early June, by the 4th of July, they were showing this uh, hot, dry, and windy. And I think he has a picture of a leaf here too. Is this just environment or is this something that the other Kyle gets next week? <laughs> <laughs> I think this is actually just environment. Yeah. So we have lots of tomato issues going on. Usually with the diseases, we'll see blotches on the leaves and not the curling. So the curling happens with like lack of water and heat. Mm -hmm. And then the margins burning is also lack of water, heat drying out from the wind. So mm -hmm. just make sure you're watering them well, especially when it's hot and when it's windy. All right, excellent. 
Well, for our second feature, we're going to return to Marlene Wagner's home that we featured a few weeks ago. Tonight, Marlene's going to talk about her vegetable garden and how that has evolved over the last 10 years. I've had the vegetable gardens for, these vegetable gardens for about 10 years now, the raised beds. Over the years, uh, we've had to redo the beds because the wood that they put in them was not what they said, so we had to refurbish them. I still love them and they've worked well for us. I, the plants that I raise, I, we have green beans and beets. We have a, I raise a variety of peppers, eggplant, two varieties of eggplant this year. Carrots, you'll see a flower in the middle of the bed that grew while I was on vacation and I let it grow and a row of green beans of which I'm going to have to put a fence around because the rabbits have found it and we used to have a dog and he kept the yard free of varmints that liked my vegetable garden and uh, so now I'm having to fence it. And we have kale and lettuce and peas and I will share that the peas and the cucumbers I haven't uh, netted the the peas because they've grown apart but cardinals liked my pea plants and were literally eating my pea plants before they set on and they were eating my cucumbers when they were tiny and uh, so we had to net that so we're going to get so we get some the we put the tomato plants back here this year just rotating. I try to rotate between the three beds um, to try and keep the, the um, disease out of the plants. I use ground leaves or in this case this year I've been using grass clippings to especially on the tomato plants. Last year I had terrible early blight and the early blight um, decimated my tomatoes or I mean I got tomatoes but not like so I decided this year I'm going to put them here they haven't been in this site for four years now or more and uh, I put grass clippings on it to keep them from getting the blight and so far it's worked. Our gardens have changed over the years and they've spread out as you can see outside of the raised beds but they're still producing we change what we grow we I don't always have um, the things that I have here this year, I'm used, doing beets and carrots. I hadn't done that before. And um, it's just been fun to try new things and to uh, experiment with what I can get to grow. And when I, somebody shares a new idea, I'm game to try it. Predators are opening. You know, it's so interesting to see how a lot of things have changed and others have remained the same in Marlene's garden. And of course, we want to say thanks to her for letting us take a look at it. It's always beautiful, and most of it is edible. All right, so um, your next insect one, Kyle. This is an Oto County viewer. Uh, several of the 30-year-old white pines have this white stuff on all the branches. She thinks it's mold or mildew. What do we think it is? Uh, this is pine bark edelgit, edeldige, excuse me. Um, and so these are kind of, um, aphid-like insects, they're very small, mm -hmm. and uh, they, they produce this, this waxy coating that the females do. Uh, so that's what you're seeing there on heavily infested branches. It can almost look like snow or something covering, covering the branch. Um, a lot of times these, you know, especially on a mature tree, they're, they're not going to cause too much harm to, to the tree. Um, but on anything younger, um, you know, anything that has some other stresses, they can cause some dieback. Uh, and be an issue. So these, these overwinter uh, as, as nymphs and then they, uh, they'll the mature fairly early in the spring, produce eggs, and then the, uh, those, those eggs will hatch uh, April through, you know, through probably uh, May. So that's really the time you want to treat for these. You can use an insecticidal soap, a hortic horticultural oil, um, and you want to target the crawlers when they're, or those immatures when they're emerging uh, in the, the, the spring. All right, excellent. Your next one here is an Auburn viewer. Uh, white pests all over the euonymus, and for a minute I thought I didn't realize what the corner was, but that's one of those variegated euonymus. So what, but what is the rest of it? Yeah, that's a euonymus scale. Mm -hmm. And so this is a non-native pest. Um, 
that, that feeds on, on euonymus, obviously. These, um, these unfortunately can be really difficult to control. And so they have two different, um, or a couple of different generations per year. So they'll produce the, the first stage of, or first group of crawlers um, in, in May and June, and then another group in July and August. But the first group is probably the best one uh, to treat. For, for treatment, uh, any heavily infested branches like that, prune them out if you can. That's, that's the best option. Mm -hmm. um, otherwise, there are many different products that are, are labeled for this, but um, unfortunately most probably, like, like many um, armored scales, they're, they're not always the most effective. Um, horticultural oils, insecticidal soaps, again, are something you can use uh, with those, those crawlers hitting that first that first batch um, you know probably around around June or so all right and your final one is also scales this is a honey locust and this is a Torrington Wyoming viewer yes uh, this looks like um, a cottony probably cottony maple scale and uh, despite the name they're you know probably most problematic on maples especially silver maple but they will they will feed on you know a variety of other other trees and so for, for this, um, in that, that image, you saw the one that was kind of producing that white, white mm -hmm. secretion. So that's actually the egg mass, and that's where they get the name cottony uh, scale from. So that's, that's the egg mass. They're producing those right now. That's, those eggs will be hatching um, in middle of July through, through August. And so treatment for those is really, you know, really targeted. You want to target that pretty soon coming up here in, towards the end of July. Again, horticultural oils, insecticidal soaps, uh, thorough coverage of those, um, those, uh, the trunk, branches, wherever you have those is uh, what you'll want to use for that. All right, excellent, thanks. All right, your, your first critter one is actually a picture of a porch. Okay. <laughs> uh, at a school, and this is in Beatrice, and it's bats. And the bats are congregating and leaving, of course, their bat droppings. Mm -hmm. They want to know how to get rid of, how, how to exclude because the children walk in. Okay. For one, um, no lights at night. Mm -hmm. Lights at night, even from out in the street, reflecting in there is, is bringing moths in, and that's why they're there. They're only there to feed. Okay. Um, or Because they're not there, at this, I can't see them there, and they look like it's a feeding area. The other thing you can do is right above the door, it looks like you have about six to eight inches, is put monophilic netting, um, like bird netting, and just mm -hmm. drape it down to the top of the door in that area, so they can't go in there. Get a, if they get them off, they can't go hang from the top because that monophilic netting would stop them. All right, excellent. And your next one is actually um, a barn swallow. Yeah. A beautiful thing. They had a lot of questions uh, because the the picture of the beauty with the five. These apparently have three parents, but we also got two or three viewers saying, "How do you get rid of? How do you exclude barn swallows?" Okay. So due to the 1974 Migratory Bird Act, you can stop them from making a nest, but once they complete their nest, you can't touch them mm -hmm. until they leave for the season. Mm -hmm. So all you can do is discourage them from making a nest, which is you can use uh, Nexolite or porcupine wire where they want to put the nest up. Mm -hmm. You can put netting around the light fixture or where they're going to put the mud mm -hmm. or hang a lot of little trinkets that they'll bump into it in that area when they're starting to build a nest. And then you can take that down after they, most of them build a nest. So usually during the month of April and May is when you have to put all this deterrent down. But by law, a regulation, and bird people are really tough, and it's like $400 a nest right. yeah. if they catch it. You can, once they complete the nest, you can't touch it until after the season. All right, and, and their other question was, why, why don't they build in the barn? They've got a barn right next to the house. <laughs> Probably because there's more insects where there's some lights. There you go. They're insect feeders, yeah. so they're helping. They're eating your mosquitoes and other insects. So. Excellent. All right, John, you have an ID, and we've gotten a lot of people asking about this particular plant. Um, this one is a Norfolk viewer. He says he sees it growing along the roadway, under tree lines. Is it a good plant for residential use? And he also sent us, I think, a picture of the flower. Yes. So that is elderberry. Uh, so wild elderberry, a lot of people pick the berries. Um, a lot of people think it has a like medicinal quality, high vitamin C, good for fighting off a cold, etc. 
Uh, so it's a great residential plant, so you can plant them. You can get the, you know, the ones that look just like this. Uh, I had brought in a sample of one that I have at home. It's a black lace elderberry, but unfortunately it didn't like the trip here. Uh, so it was a little wilty, so it went in the trash can. But it looks totally different, like the leaves are black and strappy. Mm -hmm. um, but it makes a great uh, plant for the landscape, and you get berries that you can turn into jellies, wines, etc. And you get all the birds if you don't want to go to all or that. Or you get work. all the birds. You can, so if you like feeding birds, <laughs> yeah, the, then you can have those as well. Excellent. And then your second one here is a viewer who has uh, Annabelle hydrangea, uh, but in the background, or you can see that the flowers are not exactly those great big white, white soccer balls. So right. what's happened here? Right, so a lot of the new hydrangeas, they have those big, you know, weird looking flowers, interesting flowers. Uh, but what they're actually, their parentage is some of the original, like older type hydrangeas. Mm -hmm. And what's happened here is a reversion. So basically we had this a few weeks ago when I was on, like you buy a plant, it was a mutant of, of the original hydrangea. They cut it off, they took cuttings, and that's how they got all these new hydrangeas. And now it sort of had like a reversion back to the old form. So if you like it, keep it. If you don't, get rid of it get and replace it. Right, yeah, it is a different flower form. Yeah. So, all right. Well, of course, we always have announcements of cool things in the gardening world. And we're gonna start right off with something new that is uh, extension, and this is Douglas Arpy County, right? Mostly. It's statewide. Statewide. It's everyone. <laughs> Everybody. Uh, but Grow Big Red is kind of you guys. Virtual learning series, what's happening in your garden, you register at Go Big Red, and it's every Tuesday through September with a really cool series of a uh, little bit of presentation and some Q&A. Our second one uh, tonight is the Open Garden at Daylily Drive, which is in Plymouth, Nebraska, Saturday from 8 to 4 and Sunday from 12 to 4, and I know Daylilies right now are spectacular in lots of places. And our third one is Digging Deeper with Backyard Farmer. Of course, you can watch us on Facebook Thursdays right after Backyard Farmer at 8 p.m. Follow us on Backyard Farmer in NET Nebraska to watch that show. So lots of cool stuff. All right, we're gonna have a couple of really quick questions since we have a couple of minutes left. Well, just a correction on that address. It's go.unl.edu. So it's a, it's a go yeah. URL. Slash grow big red virtual, G-R-O big red virtual. Excellent. There you go. We'll make sure that people register for that. Yes. <laughs> All right, uh, Kyle, this is also a carpenter ant question. They, uh, they have a radiant crab apple about 25 feet from the house in Fremont. They have seen the frass at the base of the tree and the ants going up and down. Do they need to worry about them coming into the house at 25 feet away? Yeah, um, certainly satellite colonies can travel, can travel great distances, you know, 100 yards or something or more. So mm -hmm. it's always a possibility. Um, you know, prevention is, is good. They're not gonna come in if there's not any moisture issues. So, you know, making sure you don't have any, any issues with that can, can be beneficial. But it's one thing that you might, might want to look into right. taking care of. All right, excellent. And Dennis, you want to do yeah. a little bit of a follow-up about the exclusion versus... Yeah, <laughs> well, when we were talking about during the lightning round, right. explosions. Well, all animals have a high point and a low point in their populations. Mm -hmm. And if you see several years of high points, it usually means a predator um, has been eliminated. And so for like ground squirrels, that's badgers and mm -hmm. fox. So if you never had a lot of moles and all of a sudden you have a lot of moles, maybe there's a coyote in the area who loves moles and the coyote left, the coyote died, or someone took out the coyote, and so therefore your moles. Because all native populations will take care of themselves. All right. Okay, they don't need to be managed, only we need to be managed. And so there's, some, there's just something natural happening because things don't explode. All right, fireworks do and we're past yeah. that. Yeah. All right.